Hello, hello, this is Mauro Fusa. We are live for the first time with a female scientist. <laughs> it's an honor <laughs> to start this uh, new chapter of the UNED Voice Lab Live. I hope we have a lot more in the future. <laughs> and we are here with a guest of honor. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce you first, our uh, colleague here, uh, Dr. Philippe Alain, and our guest. You know me already. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> I hope so. And our guest, our special guest here, Professor Catherine Verdolini Abbott, and she is Professor of Communication, Sciences and Disorders at the University of Delaware, speech language pathologist, uh, worldwide famous, and it's uh, fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No, nice here. It is an honor for us to have you here to talk uh, about yourself and your research and how you started uh, as a, this great uh, scientist you are uh, in this field of voice science. And um, I would actually ask, uh, want to start this conversation by asking you, how uh, did you start to be involved in voice science and what made you want to be a speech and language uh, um, pathologist and, and expert in communication sciences? Uh, well, I will give you the short version. Uh, the short version is my first memory of life is that I was singing and I declared to my mother that I wanted to be a singer when I grew up. That was my first, very first memory of life. And I was a singer uh, throughout all of my youth, starting uh, at a very early age in church choirs and then in high school, uh, a lot of performances, um, also semi-professional. Uh, and then I, uh, when I I was a voice major at Indiana University. I was being trained classically and I developed nodules. Um, I was singing in ranges that were very, very, very high, probably outside of my um, natural physiological range, and I developed vocal fold nodules. Um, and I, at the time, there was no speech pathologist who knew anything about working with singers. And there was no voice teacher who would work with a damaged singer, um, or there were extremely few. And I moved to New York City from Indiana um, to get voice therapy with a voice teacher who had been trained by Oren, uh, I'm sorry, he, he was a coll colleague of Oren Brown, but he had been trained by Friedrich Brodnitz, who was a laryngologist, a very famous laryngologist who worked with Metropolitan Opera and what have you. Um, my nodules uh, improved, um, but at that point I could no longer longer for administrative reasons be a voice major. And so I changed to German and Italian as a major at my university, Indiana University. And I went to Italy and I was supposed to stay there for my third year of four years of Indiana University, but I fell in love with Italy. I was performing, I was rehearsing every day, every day and every night. And uh, so I stayed for six years. And during the last year, I did three concerts, solo concerts with a very bad bronchitis. And Ooh. then I got a very serious, serious, serious injury. Um, and I could not sing at all. And so I decided to move back to the United States to study speech pathology in hopes that I could figure out how to solve my own problem. Um, because there was there was really nobody who would deal with singers with a problem, uh, a voice problem, um, apart from a couple of voice teachers in New York City. And I didn't want to be moving to New York City every time I had a voice problem. So that is how I got into um, speech language pathology. That is the short story. Wow, incredible. This is an example of a uh how um, well a misfortune can actually lead to a very uh, a success uh, uh, experiencing a career as, as yours. Um, and thanks for sharing that uh, with us. Um, and uh, so uh, I think Mauro wants to ask the next question. Yes, yes. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to say that uh, almost all speech language pathologies that I know started working voice working with voice and singing voice especially because they were singers and had injuries oh. and yeah. had the same yeah, problem. The classic <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> yes and uh in in 1983 
I gained my um, uh, certificate of clin clinical competence from ASHA, our governing board for speech language pathology. And it was Jean Westerman, uh, Greg and I, she was a voice teacher and I was also a voice teacher at that point. We were the first in 1983, we were the first singing teachers to also be certified by ASHA as speech language pathologists. We were the first in the country and now there are probably a few thousand. So the so, field has exploded since then. Since then. So mm -hmm. as a, um, in your experience, I know you work a lot with um, uh, people that are not singers themselves, but oh, yes. uh, could you um, also tell us a little bit about uh, what are the differences from a speech pathologist point of view um, to be working with someone who is a singer and someone who is not a singer? Yeah. Um, here I go back to a concept that Ingo Tietze and I developed. He had the idea and I had the idea also, and our ideas converged. This was uh, from when I went to the University of Iowa, where he was in 1990, and together we founded the first vocology track in speech language pathology, where a speech language pathologist could specialize in voice, as opposed to at the time, speech language pathology was all about fluency. It was all about child language, what have you. So Ingo was the one who developed a vocology track and I was hired as a professor there to implement the vocology track at the University of Iowa. Um, and the concept that Ingo and I both had was um, that we did not agree with the typical concept that uh, if you are a singer, for example, the speech language pathologist's job is to bring you back to health, if you have a voice problem, bring you back to health, and then we hand you off to a voice teacher who then works with vocal beauty. We strongly believed, and we strongly believe now still, that the same tools that we use for beauty are the tools that we use for health, substantially, at the level of physiology and biomechanics. And so I use very similar tools with non-singers and singers. And in fact, much of my work in speech language pathology and much of my research has come from uh, my knowledge, uh, my personal body knowledge as a singer. And I bring that personal body knowledge into my science and into the clinic room. The primary difference will come with understanding for a singer, will come with understanding of the special kinds of circumstances that a singer encounters. So depending on the type of singer, microphone, placement of speakers, uh, the stage environment, dry and dusty, performance and rehearsal demands, that a non-singer a non -singer will have other demands. For example, a teacher. Um, for a teacher, we have to bring knowledge of the context in which a teacher works large classrooms, nine hours a day, as opposed to a singer. Unfortunately, it's very sad for me that as a singer, I was I was a piano minor. And as a pianist, I could practice eight and nine hours a day. You as can't do cannot. that as a mm -hmm. singer. I was you a minor in piano hour. as well. <laughs> you only have an hour, yeah, maybe an hour and a half of full out singing, right? And I would say that even for a pianist, you cannot do the eight hours in a row because then you, no. you are more prone to develop musculoskeletal problems. So it's Absolutely. good to have, a, um, as you say in right. your book with singers, the yes. same with pianists and other yes. instrumentists that you should spread your practice throughout the day and not doing it in a row. So... Absolutely. And also with singers, there's the issue, one of the things that I found very helpful, um, I studied classical singing um, because at the time that I was studying early on, that was, if you were studying singing, that was the only type of singing you could study. You couldn't study musical theater. You couldn't study jazz that didn't exist. Um, and so um, I, I studied deeply for years, a couple of decades, classical singing, but I also performed a lot. Um, in musical theater, when I was in Italy, I was, I had two groups. One was a uh, group in folk rock. And by folk, we mean 1200s France folk, musica popolare. Mm -hmm. So not, I mean, it's a little bit of folk Bob Dylan and, you know, what have you, but <laughs> musica popolare, which we mixed, we did our own arrangements with um, rock. We, we, we mixed folk and rock, and that was interesting. And I also performed as a Renaissance singer. So I have had the good fortune of performing, training and performing in different genres of music. 
And so it's the knowledge, the personal body knowledge and the academic knowledge of these different styles and what they mean vocally, um, that knowledge and knowledge of repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, like, I really don't think that you should be doing this repertoire as a spinto soprano. You should be, you know, I think, you know, you would be better off as a, you know, light lyric soprano, et cetera, et cetera. And those considerations do not come into play with a non-singer. Um, but the, the basic essential physiological, oh, and also with a non-singer, we're working primarily with speaking range. Um, although I do believe that singing exercises are very helpful for a non-singer at a physiological level because mm -hmm. we exercise cricothyroid and, you know, all of these other things through the extremes of the ranges. Um, but, um, but if, if for singers, the, the knowledge of repertoire, and and context and the singer's emotional reactions mm -hmm. um and non-singers can have those emotional reactions as well as well yes but singers yes, are yes. a special breed yeah. yes indeed i heard you talking about vocology so mauro will ask yes, you more yes, about yes. that yeah. sure. you, uh mm -hmm. you, you wrote the book the vocology book with mm -hmm. professor ingo mm -hmm. uh, could you explain the meaning of vocology what is vocology? <laughs> yes. Yeah, wh why calling it vocology yes. and not voice science, for example? You know, that's a good question. Um, actually, that, that, that question has never been posed. Why not just voice science? First of all, vocology is a single word, as opposed to voice science is two words, same number of syllables, but voice science, vocal, <laughs> actually, vocology has more syllables. Um, but I think, and, and this term came from Ingo, Ingo developed it. And uh, uh, vocology is the study of voice in all of its as aspects, right? In all of its aspects, um, including human and animal vocalization. Ingo is uh, quick to point out. Um, but I think the term vocology, uh, he wanted to develop the term vocology as sort of a parallel to audiology, speech pathology, um, biology. Yes. Okay. Chemistology. So we lose it with chemistry, but um, I think that was, and that's a great question. I will have to ask him why not voice science. Yeah. Uh, well, I ask you that because you know some people uh, present themselves as vocologists, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, here in Europe that I know of, there is no course on vocology. You cannot be having a degree in vocology, yes, neither you, master. Yes, you can. <laughs> not can in. See. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's oh. not um, um, a European, <laughs> it, it, yet it's, it's European. not a master that has yeah. been recognized in every country like we have. For example, if you do a master in biology, then yes. that should be recognized in Spain, despite yeah. that you have made that in the United Kingdom. Why? Yeah. Because there is a, you know, a, a, a parallel. And yeah. I don't guess that, that has a parallel. So I'm I'm speaking about yes, the master yes. that it has been implemented, fully implemented in many yes. countries. Yes. So uh, that's why I, I wanted to also um, uh, make a point that the fact that you are uh, um, a, um, a person who does research in voice, could you be called that you are a vocologist? Well, that's a great question. Um, and by the way, there is no recognized, nationally recognized program of vocology in the United States either. There is, I believe that the University of Iowa no longer has the vocology track in speech language pathology. Uh, there is the Summer Vocology Institute uh, mm -hmm. run by the National Center of Voice and Speech in Salt Lake City, um, of which Ingo Tietze is the director. Um, but that, again, is not a nationally instituted program. So we have a similar situation. Uh, and uh, so the uh, Pan American Vocology Association, of which I'm currently president, uh, is in the final stages of creating a certification, a recognition program for people who will be PAVA recognized vocologists. And it has several aspects to it. It has the voice science aspect to it, and it has the the practical implementation aspect to it. Um, and so we, we actually have a similar situation in the United States as you have in Europe. 
Well, it's good to know that something is going to come and uh, we are progressing in the field. Yo, hey, it's, hooray. <laughs> yeah, within the next few months, it will be available. It, it has now just recently undergone what we call beta testing. So uh, 30 individuals, uh, not only in the United States, but outside of the United States has to have taken the written test. And we've gotten feedback about the written test um, so we can, uh, the, the test can be massaged a little bit and modulated a little bit. Um, should be released, the whole recognition program should be released in the next couple of months. Wonderful. We will be uh, with our eyes on it. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, I would like to ask you something um, about uh, evidence-based practices in the moment. So, you know that evidence-based practices, uh, um, well, at least evidence-based is a term that comes from the medical field. Uh, and refers to the meta-analysis where you do a statistical comparison of results of many studies that use the same methodology uh, in order to come to a, a definite conclusion on what are the effects of something uh, in the body, for example. So can we say that at the moment uh, uh, we in speech, voice and language pathology field and also in voice, uh, you know, education in general, uh, we have uh, enough evidence so that we can start calling it uh, evidence-based practices? Well, you have touched on uh, one of my favorite topics. Um, and uh, it's my, I'm trying to decide what is the best entry point to my comments here. First of all, uh, I have a whole lecture that I do on evidence-based practice, evidence-based medicine. My clinical practice has largely been in medical uh, settings, so I continue to call it evidence-based medicine because I believe that what we do um, anything that has to do with healing, even if we are behavioral practitioners, is medicine, medicine for the soul, medicine for art, medicine. OK, so uh, I call it evidence based medicine, uh, although I understand why it's called evidence based practice. Um, and, and I start my lecture on evidence based medicine with the comments. It's a really good thing. It's a really important thing. It guards against, it wants to guard against and speak against what we call snake oil here in the United States. Snake oil was um, a concept that arose when in the, you know, pioneer 1800s United States, people were crossing the country in caravans and covered wagons and what have you. And someone would, pre would present themselves as a physician and they would sell people at great cost snake oil, oil that came from snakes. The elixir of amour. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly, exactly. And it was just nonsense. It was a way of making money. It was a way of creating a cult around an individual or around a product or what have you. And it did nothing. It was just taking people's money. Um, uh, and so evidence-based medicine wants to guard against snake oil and evidence-based medicine is a good thing. I make a living doing evidence-based medicine. I have received probably close to $10 million from the United States government doing evidence-based medicine. So it's a good thing. And at the same time, we have what my colleague Eva van Leer calls evidence-based medicine, the dark side. <laughs> the dark side of evidence-based medicine. And I, ha I make seven points about this, and I won't run you through all seven points about it. And the seven points are not meant to get a do away with evidence-based medicine. They are meant for us to be as cautious and judicious about evidence-based medicine as evidence-based medicine wants us to be about our practice. So one of the first problems with evidence-based medicine, you just brought it up, Philippa, um, is that uh, we are supposed to make our clinical and our pedagogical decisions based on the best possible evidence from published peer-reviewed work, right? Well, the problem is that the best evidence is considered to be the randomized control trial. That's the best, right? Double, double blind, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, double blind, placebo controlled, crossover, randomized. I've control. made one. I've made one. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I've made one as well uh, with a placebo. Yeah, um, me too. And, yeah. On pills and pregnancy and all that. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. The problem is that the randomized control trial gives you the average result 
for the average subject, the average patient. And the average patient might not have even existed in that trial itself. So if we take an average of our height here, the three of us, the average might be 171, a meter 71. But it might be that none of us are exactly 171. It might be that one of us is 165 and another two of us are 180. Okay, so the question is, did the average patient even exist in the trial? And the RCT will give you the average result for the, the average result for the average patient. It might be that nobody got the average result either. And it might be that the patient that you are going to see this afternoon is not the average patient. So that is a big, big conceptual mathematical flaw with our understanding of evidence-based medicine in the RCT. Uh, and case-based reasoning can be reason, uh, can be very rigorous. So, so reasoning based on analogy. Um, there are many, many, many more problems with the way that, oh, a, a second problem is that in the model, we're supposed to make our clinical decisions based on the best evidence, our clients' values and preferences, our own expertise, and the institutional environment. And so we can say all of these things are supposed to be incorporated into our clinical decisions, but they're not if we're going simply on evidence-based medicine. Now, the proponents of evidence-based medicine will tell you, no, no, those things are in the model. They're in the model. I can show you graphics that show that those factors are in the model. Well, if that's the case, why is it still called evidence-based medicine? Why is it not called evidence values, experience, context. It's not called that. It's called evidence-based medicine. And another issue is that evidence-based medicine tends to protect against alpha error. Okay. Alpha error is uh, the error in concluding that something is true when it's not. Mm -hmm. Evidence-based medicine protects strongly against alpha error. But when we protect against alpha error, we inflate beta error. And beta error is the error of concluding something is not true when it is. Yeah. Right? Like a false positive. Yeah, we protect against false positives, but in doing so, we inflate, we incur false negatives. We conclude mm -hmm. that something is not true when in fact it is. We conclude that a treatment does not work when in fact it does. Another problem is with statistics also with statistics. And that is that statistics are based on probability. They're, they're based on a curve of likelihood. But yet we take evidence-based medicine to say, this works, that doesn't, that's binary. And that flies in the face of a deep understanding of statistics. And another problem is that people have become now, here's where I hesitate about this little talk that I'm giving you right now and my larger talk that I've given a whole lecture. In a place, in a culture that is filled with snake oil, we need to move towards evidence-based medicine. But the problem in the United States is that we have moved so far towards evidence-based medicine in speech language pathology that when I teach, for example, I teach in the master's program. And by the time they get to the, the second year, the end of their master's program, they are very robotic. They're like robots. I cannot do that. Evidence, 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 evidence. And I want to slap them. <laughs> I want to slap them because there is a scientific foundation for intuition and creativity. There is a massive tradition in cognitive science from the past 20, 30, 40 years about intuition. So I walk, one time I asked a, a colleague, uh, Janina Casper, I said, Janina, I said, how do you know what you're going to do? How do you know what's going on with a patient? Okay, I have the ENT diagnosis. I've looked at the folds myself. Uh, I have studied, you know, voice science for 40 years. But what, okay, tell me about when you walk into the room. She says, I walk into the room, I look I observe, I feel, I know. And she said to me, what do you do? I said, Janina, 
I walk into a room, I look, observe, I feel, I know. So one of the problems with an obsession with evidence-based medicine to the exclusion of the rest is that we tend to exclude scientifically grounded intuition and creativity. For example, mirror neurons. I can feel if I turn around and I make a sound, you know in your body what I have done. If I go, uh, you know what I've done. You know what I've done. You feel it in your body, right? That evidence-based medicine doesn't talk about that. At least well, it happened so far. I, I, I'm, I'm really appreciating this because uh, I, I, I myself talk about uh, meaningful feedback instead of evidence-based medicine because i think it's more important the, the type of feedback that you give to not my client because i work with singers or to your student rather than if it's based on what someone has discovered or not or exactly if you exactly. say something like uh you are lacking on support what is the meaning for that yeah. first of all don't get me going on the word support <laughs> even get me do not even go there because we don't have no, no. Time no no we Thank move you. on Mauro, Mauro, ask your question please <laughs> wait a second just two more things one it touches on exactly what you said filipa and that is how do we know that something is true do we know something is true for our patient because we read about it in a paper or because we're standing half a meter from that person's face so knowledge can be in the moment. And finally, a final point here, and there are other points, is that there, this is interesting. This, was, this point was made by a colleague of mine, Alan Kamai. There is actually no evidence that evidence-based medicine improves clinical outcomes. So there you have it. So now I'm done. And final, final thing here is that there are some things called first principles that we don't have to test in a randomized control trial. So there is a fabulous article put out by some British people several years ago. Um, they wanted to do a meta-analysis, systematic review and meta-analysis on the utility of using a parachute during free fall when jumping out of airplanes, <laughs> okay? They found no randomized placebo-controlled crossover trials on the utility of a parachute when jumping out of airplanes. So they concluded, <laughs> that the continued use of parachutes when jumping out of airplanes is based on low levels of anecdotal evidence, right? Hmm. That, and of course, the article got all kinds of push. It's per the article, non fa una piega, we say in Italian. I don't know if you, non fa una piega, right? It doesn't make a fold, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So there are first principles that we can use to create therapy and voice teaching in the moment that we don't have to subject to randomize control trials. So you have now gotten my, a short version of my soapbox, <laughs> um, my preaching on evidence-based practice. It's Wonderful. Good, don't yeah, abandon it. Another no. problem I see, uh, we have, uh, especially in voice teaching, we have a lot of uh, voice scientists <laughs> creating terms and creating creating signs. <laughs> so they say, oh, I'm, I'm evidence-based based <laughs> myself. And that's another thing is that a lot of voice teachers, when they started learning voice science, started feeling that their teaching got worse instead of better. And the reason is that knowing what you want someone to do biomechanically is very different from knowing how to teach it. Mm -hmm. Completely different disciplines. And in fact, my PhD is not in voice science. My PhD is in cognitive science and motor learning. How do people acquire new information? And it turns out from the literature that one of the worst ways that we can attempt to teach somebody how to do something physical is to tell them what to do physically. Yeah, it's in your vocology book. I've, I've read it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bless you. <laughs> okay, since you mentioned the, the, the motor learning, <laughs> let's talk about motor learning, uh, exercise physiology, uh, so, based on all this evidence-based talk, <laughs> which concepts of these uh, areas can we already say that are possible to transfer to to great to question, great question. Because yeah. especially, for example, sorry, the exercise physiology. We know that the thyroid muscle is not the same of the 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 leg muscle or an arm muscle. Yeah, they so are very how different can you muscles. These They're striated. 
They're both striated. They're both voluntary muscles, but yes. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, uh, Mauro. That's a great question. Um, one of my, two of my former doc students, um, Chaya Devi Nanjundeshwaran and Adriana Schemble, all three, four actually, um, Amanda Gillespie and Aaron Ziegler uh, did their dissertations in exercise physiology uh, for voice, starting to get at this question. None of them looked at muscle types. There is another former doc student whom I shared with another professor, Carrie Tellis, who started to look at exactly that issue. And one of the, the, the suggestions that she came up with, or the, the, the muscle typing issue, one of the questions that she came up with, questions that she came up with was about interarytenoid and type one versus type two muscles. And uh, type uh, type two muscles, you can't, you can't, I think there's debate, but I think there's general consensus that with the type of exercise that you do, you can't transform a muscle from a type two to a type one muscle. <laughs> but within a muscle fiber type, the type of exercise that you do can shift the relative proportion is we're talking type two fibers right now can shift in relative proportion of anaerobic versus aerobic fibers, right? So type two has uh, different subtypes. Um, and so her suggestion was maybe if IA intraretinoid she was speaking of specifically, um, got a lot of use in ballistic action over time, maybe that muscle would then become predisposed to anaerobic metabolism, uh, contributing to vocal fatigue because anaerobic mechanisms are going to fatigue very quickly within 30 seconds, as compared to more uh, endurance uh, type uh, fibers, which uh, have uh, more endurance. Um, and so that was the suggestion. I have uh, a current doctoral student, uh, Chris Affelbach, who is doing his dissertation on creating a test for muscle fatigue that doesn't directly look at uh, muscle fiber types in the larynx, but, uh, uh, sort of gets at the question indirectly. So that's a great question. In terms of exercise physiology, Chaya's, Chaya Davies' um, dissertation got at the possibility, can be debated, but got at the possibility that one of the things that's going on with, with uh, vocal fatigue is, in fact, the use of anaerobic mechanisms during speech as opposed to a aerobic mechanisms. And she found that individuals with vocal fatigue, diagnosed with vocal fatigue, um, tended to use, and, and this was based on gas exchanges and VO2 max and, all, and VO2 and all this other kind of stuff. Um, she found that they tended to use in loud extended speech, extended only six or seven minutes, but nonetheless extended, uh, tended to be using anaerobic mechanisms during loud speech as compared to individuals who did not have vocal fatigue and were cardiovascularly trained, they tend to be using aerobic mechanisms uh, during this um, extended loud speech and recovered very quickly metabolically um, after the speech event. Now, there are a few interpretive problems there. Also, individuals who were not cardiovascularly trained and who uh, did not have vocal fatigue also tended to be using anaerobic mechanisms, but uh, the, the question remains, uh, the, the question is still out there. Okay. So that is, these are really, really important questions. Um, and I, I, I've, I've yeah. seen some studies with rats and vocalizations mm -hmm. with rats and then um, in, inflating different things to the muscles and all that. Uh, but I, I still guess that the field is still very in these early very, days, isn't it? Very so undeveloped. To answer yeah. your question, how much can we take straight from exercise physiology and bring into voice is better than we can try, but we don't have much confidence. So until evidence comes along, we can do our best to try. Um, and there is one person in the world of, with whom I'm familiar who has, who is a speech pathologist and has a PhD in exercise physiology. She doesn't dabble in it. She hasn't read articles in it. She has a PhD in exercise physiology, and that's a former master's student of mine, Mary Sandage, and she's at Auburn University. Um, and so she is a great conversational partner on this topic. Wonderful. We take yeah. note yeah. of that. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I attended some, some courses of her. She's fantastic. Yes, she is. She's wonderful. <laughs> and you might hear my uh, grandson upstairs who is expressing himself vocally. <laughs>
<laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and uh, you advocate a lot uh, on the resonant voice mm -hmm. and the resonant voice therapy, Lisa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, could you please explain us uh, what are the theoretical underpins of these types of exercises? And yeah. can we think of these exercises or the resonant voice even for the amplified singing? You know, that's a great question, amplified singing. So first, let me go to the physiological underpinnings. Um, the article is old by now, but it's still valid. Um, Ingo and I have a have a bugaboo. Sometimes when we give our, our students tests, we require that they cite the most recent evidence. And if they cite evidence that's more than five years old, they have to justify it. And Ingo and I feel that some of the stuff that's old are classics. You know, Isaac Newton's work on gravity, that's a classic, you know, you don't discard it just because it's 300 years old. Um, and so this this paper is old, but I, I think it's still, and I think it's still valid. Paper, um, Dave Barry was a lead author, 2001. And so what we found was that a vocal fold configuration that other studies had shown corresponds to resonant voice, and that's barely touching or barely separated vocal folds, um, corresponds to a laryngeal posture, a laryngeal behavior, that when you keep everything else constant, when you keep FO constant, when you keep subglottic pressure constant, will give you the greatest output intensity in terms of dB for the least amount of impact intensity for the vocal folds. In other words, this is the configuration that will give you nice strong voice while minimizing your um, your risk of injury. It's not gonna protect you 100%, but it's minimizing your risk of injury. Um, so those are the physiological underpinnings. And we have found that, oh, and that vocal fold configuration corresponds perceptually. And usually, very often, there is not a nice correspondence between what's going on physiologically and a perceptual outcome. But in this case, there is, for good reasons that I won't get into. Um, but that configuration corresponds to uh, perceptually uh, corresponds with voice in which people feel vibrations in the front of their face and their voice feels easy. And there, again, there are reasons for that connection. So that should be a good thing for vocalization in general. Um, and we have also found that the use of that, uh, that, uh, that resonant voice, we will call it, um, has anti-inflammatory effects for um, acute injury for acute inflammatory injury, and that injury could be uh, could be a biomechanical injury from voice use, or it could be injury, if you will, from an illness, from a virus, from a bacterium, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those are kind of in brief the physiological underpinnings of resonant voice. Now, um, I I'm going to come to your question, and then I'm going to amplify your question. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say this first. I have found after 20, 25, 30 years, well, 1985 was when I first started working intensively with resonant voice in my own voice and with my training and speech pathology. So 85, 95, so a long time, 35 years. Um, after about 25 years of using it um, strongly in a strong version every day in clinic, um, my voice started to lose flexibility. I wasn't singing as much, I have to acknowledge, as I had been earlier. My voice started losing flexibility, started losing the ability to move quickly in singing and in speech. I started to lose high notes, not because I had an injury. Um, and the idea there was, uh, what I have concluded, is that anytime we use a given, a single voice physiology, exclusively or intensively, we burden the musculature in a way that it loses some of its other capabilities. Mm -hmm. So that is a caution. That is a caution that I discovered in my own voice and I would caution others. So I, th I now think that good training, good voice speaking training and good singing voice training trains multiple physiologies, no, just one, right? And so this gets at your question, Mauro. And that is, is this good for amplified singing? Uh, well, first of all, I guess my response would be for any kind of singing, 
even classical singing, where we are told that our voices need to have a consistent quality throughout the voice range, no matter what we're doing. Artistically, I would push back against that, artistically. But when we go to other singing genres, would we want to use resonant voice exclusively in any, any genre? And my answer would be no, artistically and biomechanically, for both of those reasons. But especially biomechanically, we're talking about now. And in terms of microphone singing, um, I think it's one option for us, but I would not recommend it now for three reasons. Yeah. For three reasons, I would not recommend it exclusively. One, artistically. Two, mechanically. And three, because of what microphones do to our voices. So resonant voice is already strong, right? And if you're going to use it in a big time way, you're going to have to be messing with your microphone. You can't be standing it. Well, you got to be messing. You got to be, you know, working with your microphone. Adjusting, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, adjusting the microphone. Uh, adjusting the, the, the microphone. Um, but can I sing? Okay, let's take uh, musical theater. Um, I am actually just getting over the worst laryngitis I had in my life. I thought it was COVID. It was not, but I could play okay. you a horrible. I had COVID two years ago. Um, but, uh, it was horrible. So I'm just recovering from it. So let's see if I can do this. Um, I had a dream in time gone by when I was young and life worth living. I would consider that mixed resonant voice. It works. Yeah. But depending on where you are, how you're portraying the character, that might not be the choice that you want. I had a dream in time gone by when I was young and life worth living. I wouldn't call that resonant voice. That might work better. Right. And here, this is where we get into the whole notion even more of how do we work with singers compared with non singers? Here, I am a great lover of Joe Estel's work mm -hmm. because Joe Estel was the one in her voicecraft. She was the one and the only one whom I know who not only advocated but developed systematically different mechanical approaches to voice, all of which I think are safe, uh, but different, uh, safe and effective for different styles. Oh, wonderful. So that, is, that is something that we I don't want to be a spoiler, but on Friday, we will have an appointment with someone who is working with the uh, uh, still voice technique. So we're I looking highly for recommend. that. <laughs> I highly recommend. Also, I, I have another question uh, for you that uh, I will uh, want to add to this talk about resonant voice. I'm sure you are aware of the term flow phonation. Absolutely. So uh, what are the similarities uh, between flow phonation and resonant voice? Yeah. That depends on uh, if you're Johann Sundberg or <laughs> if you are Ed Stone. Johan and I have had several conversations about this, uh, the way that Johan and the Swedes define uh, flow voice at a laryngeal level, it's identical to, to resonant voice. Identical. It's barely touching or barely separated vocal folds. The diff and so the aerodynamic characteristics are identical as well. But there is still complete the vocal closure. <laughs> Yeah, there's good vocal full closure, not over closure, but mm -hmm. there's good closure. Okay. Um, and the difference uh, uh, it, between resonant voice and the way that Johan talks about it is simply in the fact that in resonant voice, we also take into consideration, not in the paper by Barry, by the way, in 2001, we also take into consideration vocal track adjustments, mm -hmm. which flow voice does not negate, but it doesn't address directly, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are Ed Stone in the United States at Vanderbilt University, and if you are me and I have done a randomized control trial comparing resonant voice and uh, flow voice that's about to be submitted, uh, we have uh, yeah, a couple of different trials, actually. We have one, one large trial of 105 teachers and another one on wound healing. But at any rate, um, uh, in the United States, flow voice has been used to understand vocal folds that are slightly more abducted than for resonant voice. So instead of a half a millimeter of separation of the vocal processes, we're probably talking a millimeter, 
millimeter separation. We have the data on resonant voice. Resonant voice corresponded in, if you put together, integrate a couple of different studies, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 millimeters of separation at the vocal processes, if you want to know. Flow voice is probably more on the order of a millimeter. Okay, so we're talking of a fraction of a millimeter of difference. And aerodynamically, flow uh, resonant voice in a healthy larynx is probably going to be about 120 milliliters of airflow per second. Uh, flow voice is probably in a healthy larynx going to be about 180. Okay. So the difference uh, perceptually would be um, uh, my mother makes muffins. I'll try to use the same utterance. My mother makes muffins. Wait a minute. I'm going to do two different. Items. My mother makes muffins. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? It's short of breathy. It's not breathy. But I'll do resonant voice first. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Flow voice. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And we have found that flow voice has the same, um, has the same reparative, sorry. Um, I just I'll, remember that I need to. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I was, sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, flow voice has the same reparative uh, capabilities as resonant voice, which is interesting. So tissue mobilization um, better than voice rest. Wonderful. And uh, you would agree that, um, I mean, can we find normative data for that? Or should we approach the field into a more like individual necessities and therefore each individual will have his own, his or she or he, his or hers own uh, thresholds. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and, and this speaks to personalized medicine, if you will, mm -hmm. which is kind of a pushback against the way we usually think of evidence-based medicine. It's a different type of evidence. Um, so uh, personalized, yes, personalized medicine. Um, in the paper, which I hope we will have published soon, we will give not evidence, but opinions. Uh, based on messing around in the lab, that's what we finally fondly call just messing around, playing around in the lab, that uh, resonant voice is probably on the order of 120 and flow voice is probably on the order of 180. And you can cite that if you want, but yes, personalized. So when you sit somebody in front of, you know, an airflow mask and you have them do flow voice and you go, yeah, that, that right there, whatever that airflow is, use that for them. That is a great question, Filipa. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mauro, continue. I will shut up now. <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> okay, let's go to your, uh, another publication uh, you, you have uh, about the importance of the, the patient compliance for the results of voice therapy. Uh, yeah. yeah. What can we do in order to increase yeah. this compliance? Yeah. Well, first of all, when that chapter was written, compliance was still an okay term. Um, and most people don't like the term because it implies a hierarchy. So the physician tells you what to do or the clinician tells you what to do and you do it. Um, some people have then used the term adherence. I think that solves nothing. I prefer the term engagement. You know, what can we do to facilitate, to foster um, patient, uh, patient or uh, student engagement. And, you know, you've read about a lot of factors in that chapter, and those factors still hold. Um, so self-efficacy. Uh, does the patient, does the student uh, feel that they can uh, perform a certain behavior or exercise? And that self-efficacy is not limited to just vocal, can I do it vocally, but do I have time? Are we asking the patient to get up at 4.30 in the morning before their usual five o'clock to do these exercises? They can't do that, right? So self-efficacy covers, is, is the most studied factor in all of the healthcare literature on patient engagement. There are thousands of studies on it. And uh, we can confidently, confidently incorporate it into what we do. Are you able to do this? Um, and there are a whole series of other factors that have been shown in the literature uh, to affect patient engagement. Um, and I, I would like to mention two of them that are not written up in the literature. Well, one of them is kind of written up, but not enough emphasized. And the other one is not written up in literature. And another doctoral student of mine, Annie Rubino, is now doing her dissertation in uh, this topic. And the topic is identity. 
people will often say, but, you know, they produce this wonderful resonant voice and they say, but it's not me. They say, this is me, right? This is me, <laughs> okay? And so Annie is looking at the question of identity and the extent to which someone identifies with a given vocalization pattern because that's important to know. You know, they come to you because, you know, they lose their voice twice a week, but yet they identify with that voice type. Okay, so what, you know, what do we do with that? And Annie is developing some ideas about what we do with that. And her dissertation is, there's a very nice study uh, that she's replicating actually, uh, but extending it. Uh, very nice study, and I'll tell you what her study is. Um, the study was an fMRI study, which she is doing, where, um, uh, actors come in, regular people, as we say in Italian, um, Cristiani Normali, for some reason in Italian they say, for person, they sometimes say Cristiano. Povero Cristiano, poor person, right? Uh, so regular people. And then she has people with voice disorders, nodules. And she asks them to read a sentence, answer a question with just spontaneously. And then she asked them to answer another question or the same question as with a British accent. And then she asked them to answer a question as if they were Romeo or Juliet, depending on gender. And then she asked them to answer a question using resonant voice after brief training in resonant voice, right? And so first of all, she has, she has preliminary data on 12 subjects and she found that subjects with nodules had the least amount of behavioral change, acoustic change in what they did that is not necessarily attributable to their nodules. Could argue it's attributable to nodules, but not necessarily. So they changed FO, you know, X, FO excursion the least, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then she puts them under a scanner. And what she finds, it replicates what somebody else had found in a similar study, but without people with nodules and actually without normal people, just looking at actors. What she found was with actors, they had suppression, neurological, neurophysiological, cortical suppression of identity centers. So in other words, for them in these various uh, conditions that were not just their spontaneous voice. So when they did British, British voice, but speaking as themselves, but moreover, more importantly, when they spoke as Roman, Romeo and Juliet, they showed neurophysiological evidence of suppressing their own identity in order to sound like Romeo or Juliet. The people with nodules didn't do that. They did not suppress their own identity. Could we and say that, had, then that the people with no, that develop nodules have a stronger sense of identity in their no, voices? Identity no? with whatever aspect of aspect their person it was their lives. that created the nodules or is the nodules, right? Now, she, she's only run 12 subjects and there were only four in that group um, and fMRI data are messy to interpret. She, she is continuing that study. But the possibility, and, and this, this can't apply to everybody who had, has nodules, right? What do you do with an actor who has nodules or a singer? Those are not actors, singers, blah, blah, blah. But there is a possibility that some people, again, we don't want us to take average results and generalize them, but some people who come to voice therapy, especially those with behaviorally induced voice problems, may relate very strongly to their own identities and therefore covertly resist changes in vocalization patterns that can bring them back to vocal health. So she's not saying that happens with everybody. Mm -hmm. She's saying when you are evaluating a patient, that is something you might want to address Address. and there is a scale for that it's called the vocal congruence scale and when that that assesses the degree to which people identify with their given vocalist existing vocalization pattern and the the case in point she also has survey data for um people uh, uh people who are cisgender and transgender right and the people who are transgender have strong incongruence tend to have strong incongruence with their voices as they are and i believe that this was treatment seeking people so uh, uh, a trans female Mm -hmm. who sounds like a male has strong incongruence and 
Therefore, the notion is strong motivation to change. Change, yes. And little resistance to change sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Yes, right? yes. Mm -hmm. But people with nodules, some people with nodules who have a voice problem that was created by their voice use may identify, and this goes for singers, they don't identify. And so surgeons, laryngologists are sometimes, are often very careful about operating on singers, especially famous singers. Think Adele, okay? Think other singers who, who are known whose hallmark is Rod who's Stewart. Rod Stewart, I think, I believe, had nodules and he never operated them because That's it was right. part of his identity. That's part of his identity, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, what we call the artistic uh, uh, landmark or something like that. Yeah, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah there's a word. There is uh, a word for yeah, that. I can't think of it, yeah. But we can say artistic identity or... Artistic uh, identity. And going back, so I think that identity... And I think Annie is going to, with her research, is going to bring this factor, a, a novel factor, a new factor, not new, but new for us to consider. We've kind yes. of forgot. We, we talk about it a little bit, but we don't do much with it. Um, and the other thing that I think is central, the most important thing, the most important thing above everything else, beyond everything else, well beyond everything else, is the clinician, is the person is the presence. I believe when we are presence, it what, it's what my colleague Kate DeVore calls that other thing. So when I give all these lectures, you know, and she took a whole course on voice disorders for me many years ago. And, you know, at the end of the course, she raises her hand in the back of the room and she goes, she's fabulous, by the way. She's an actor, singer, fabulous. She raises her hand and she goes, I still think it's that other thing. <laughs> other thing, calls, right? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is the spirit, is the energy, is the connection. So when I am there and I am present, I'm going to pick stuff up that I will never read about in a paper. I'm going to pick up subtle stuff. I'm going to be there. I'm going to notice it. I'm with you. So I think that in terms of patient engagement, it's in terms of the whole thing, mm -hmm. in terms of the whole damn process, that is the most critical factor. It, you could have, you could be the father of voice science and not have good results, good engagement or good results because you're not present. Well, it's uh, unbelievable, uh, uh, fresh, freshening to hear you talking. And uh, um, I think we could uh, be talking all afternoon here. <laughs> you, you have so many things to say and about that. And you are a female. And because you have so many things to say and being a female, and last Friday, we've commemorated the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, to finish our talk, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it has to be, um, mm -hmm. on asking you um, if you want to share with us your experiences of what means to you to be a female doing voice science. I will tell you exactly. And it's, yeah, it's, it's potentially a little bit of a shocking um, response. I have never taken into consideration the fact that I'm a female, ever. I have done what I wanted to do. And my attitude has been, screw you if you can't take a joke. So my strongest, and I could use a stronger word there. We sometimes use it in English, but I won't say it here because it's. <laughs> um, F you if you can't take a joke, right? So my attitude as a woman has been to be a person and to do what I freaking wanna do. Get out of my way. Now, do I bring particular qualities to that task as a woman? Maybe, I don't know. But that is my message to women. Do what you wanna do. You know, now we have the pipeline issue. Are women, girls, generally considered not to be strong 
as strong as boys in STEM. And so we're not nurtured in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now that's, that's potentially a problem. I was very weak in mathematics. I thought I was very weak in mathematics. It turns out that once I had to do voice science, I had to do mathematics. And I discovered that when I wanted to do it, I was, I was okay at it. Um, so there is a pipeline issue. But in terms of how others might view us, in terms of not having the same opportunities as men, screw that. Do what you want to do. So that's my message to him. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, uh, yes, an applause uh, it deserves. Thank you. <laughs> it's delightful and so easy to talk to you because uh, I can tell that we are of like mind and you are, you are, your minds are active and and wonderful and insightful. And so it's so much fun to have a conversation with you. Well, I admire you deeply. So thank you for hearing those words. And uh, Mauro shares my admiration, admiration oh, towards you. <laughs> so uh, Spain is uh, uh, looking for this life, I'm sure. We will subtitle it afterwards and it will be available on our YouTube channel. So once again, Kitty, thank you so much. In, in, the, in the bottom of my heart, I know that you have very many commitments and uh, Besides all, you have also your family commitment. So your effort of being today uh, with us here, it's being very much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much. And I hope I will no see you soon in a conference, if not in Pivot, maybe next year in uh, Voice Foundation. Who knows? I, I hope. I would love that. I will look forward to it. Me too. Bye-bye. Namaste. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.